So far we have looked at the differences between motion, action and gesture. Um, but this concept of gesture is, is quite tricky to understand more about. So now we're going to visit a colleague of mine and um, hear how he is thinking about this concept of gesture. Come. Hallå, hallå! Hej! Hygglig, hygglig. The baseline of all this is that music is a multimodal art. It involves both the sense of motion and the sense of sound. And of course it can involve also a sense of vision, even maybe the sense of smell. Uh, it's, it's a multimodal art. And uh, for that reason, it's better to try to be precise when we speak about it. Uh, when we speak about uh, music and body motion, we can say we have body motion to make sound. We have body motion to modify sound. Uh, we have body motion that somehow complements the sound, like in dance, choreography, and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, it's clear that at the end of the day, the essential point is precisely to understand how music is composed of both motion, body motion, I prefer that term, and uh, sound. We now can say uh, we have a basic understanding of music as a phenomenon, uh, well established both from our own research and uh, from neuroscience that uh, there is a very strong hardwired coupling, as they say in the neuroscience, between what we hear and our sense of body motion. And as we know from our research, uh, observing musicians and uh, dancers, that uh, most people tend to spontaneously associate musical sound with some kind of body motion. Mm. Another topic that is, is uh, quite important in your research, I know, is, is that of co-articulation. Uh, it's a difficult word, but could you try to briefly explain how you are thinking about co-articulation in, oh, in yes. music? Yes, yes, uh, with pleasure. Uh, co-articulation means that uh, in human motion, and by the way also in robotics and also in animation, uh, you have the fact that uh, body parts are constantly on the move. So, uh, the easiest explanation is to look at your mouth when you are speaking. Uh, whenever you are pronouncing a word, you can see the shape of the mouth, the lips and the tongue. Uh, you follow the motion of the tongue. And you'll discover that when you are saying something, you are also preparing the next sound that we are going to make. And also, when you are saying something, you are, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, conditioned by what you just did. In music, if you are going to play the piano and hit a key uh, way up on the keyboard, you necessarily have to move your hand in order to hit it, because you don't have a finger that's uh, that long. So this means that you always are in a context of uh, motion. And uh, this is quite uh, determining for how music is shaped, both vocal music and instrumental music. So. If you look at the score, what is called Western common music notations, you have dots, C sharp, F sharp, G and so on, which are discrete events. But when it comes to performance, the body has to somehow move between the keys or in vocal uh, performance, you have to move from one pitch to another. So essentially, you always have a smearing. And that's the word I use. Uh, meaning that uh, you don't have clean-cut uh, different events, but they tend to go into a continuous uh, stream of sound, exactly like in language. And that, by the way, is one of the reasons why it's difficult to learn foreign languages, because uh, speech is continuous. In other words, speech is co-articulated, as they say. Uh, so you have to be able to pick out the discrete events from a continuous stream. Mm. And in your research, um, I know you've been working theoretically on this, but also uh, I know that you're working in the lab with experiments on these yes. things. Uh, can you just tell a little bit about how you're actually doing this and what you're doing in the lab? Yes, uh, we try to figure out exactly what musicians are doing. Uh, so far we have, at least for, for, for my research, I've focused mostly on what we call sound producing body motions in music. So what we do is that we use this uh, uh, so-called uh, motion capture technology, which is essentially infrared camera system with markers. 
and then we place markers on the fingers, uh, hands, arms, shoulders, whole torso, head, feet, and so on, depending upon what we are interested in studying. So in the example of uh, piano performance, uh, uh, it looks like almost a person having smallpox with all these uh, markers on the hands. And then we have very detailed information about how this preparatory motion is going on all the time. Uh, the next project will be drumming, a uh, drum set, uh, because as you know, you have the tam-tams, you have the ride and hi-hat, the bass drum, kick, snare, whatever. And whatever rhythmical pattern the drummer is playing needs to have this constant motion because you hit the ride and then you are hitting the, the snare. And the moment you hit the ride, the stick bounces off and you try to aim as best you can for the next event. So in that sense, you always have this context and it also is um, mobilizing the rest of the body, the torso, the drummer will sit on, on a stool like this and uh, try as best uh, he or she can to uh, exploit the rebound. A uh, drummer has to conserve energy, otherwise he or she would be completely exhausted after a couple of minutes. So you have all this, again, returning to your uh, main question, you have all this uh, embodiment, uh, the, how the body is an integral part of the music making and the body motion, of course. And then uh, somehow the body has to adapt to the constraints, as we say, of the physics of the musical instrument. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs>